So you can see the title of the WebEx today. So using TOGAF to support technology transformation. There's a few aspects that we're going to cover. We're going to cover some of the, the good and bad ways, I guess, technology transformation has been applied across different industries. We'll see how maybe it affects us um, in daily life and in some real world scenarios. And we'll also be covering, I guess, what we've classified as some of the five steps um, to successful transformation projects. Before jumping um, into that content, however, it's probably worth, again, just maybe reintroducing us as Avolution and me as a uh, 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 software consultant at Avolution. Um, we produce a, a product called Abacus, which is an enterprise architecture tool. Um, but really our role and specifically my role as well at the company is to make sure that we're actually building solutions that can help solve these types of problems. So for those of you who have sat on other calls we've done previously, you would have heard us talk about things like road mapping, how to manage cloud migrations, how to actually work through things like technical debt within organizations as well. And this, of course, is now just another one of those WebExes where we can talk specifically around technology transformation um, and maybe more generally digital transformation as well. We've got TOGAF in the title, and that's actually an important aspect of today. We're going to be touching on TOGAF. Um, and maybe even some other frameworks as we go through, because TOGAF is one of those that is, of course, highly popular. Um, it's one of those architecture frameworks that tends to get used as almost like a toolbox environment. And that's, again, something we'll touch on. But really, the demand is there for that certification. And you can even see here the number of certifications that have increased. And so to us, that's important. The fact that other users across the globe want to understand more about TOGAF, want to understand more about architecture, um, of course, is fundamental to, to supporting things like transformation programs. Certifications themselves are useful from a tool perspective and a, and a people perspective. Um, it tends to, of course, just show the type of skills that you've learnt. And of course, the important part of that is applying those then, of course, to these real world scenarios. Now, there are various other frameworks or what we call standards out there as well. And as again, I've mentioned various certifications for these, but really these should be used as some kind of structure, you know, some kind of framework, as the name suggests, of building up some of the collateral, some of the content and some of the modeling aspects within tools. So again, the majority of the frameworks, these reference tools, these notations are typically going to be customized. Um, and again, this is something we've touched on previously with TOGAF. Um, it's customizable. You know, use the elements that are necessary for whichever program, project, or modeling notation you want to be using. There are a whole bunch of other concepts within the architecture frameworks and standards as well. So again, we're not going to be touching on too much of these today, but if you do want to know more about these, obviously feel free to ask us after today's call as well. Now, TOGAF, of course, has a strong concept of business scenarios, and we can treat something like technology transformation or digital transformation as a typical business scenario. So there are various aspects or phases to that model, and certainly the aspects here in terms of gathering the information, analyzing that, and then reviewing that content are aspects which we've simply extended upon when we start talking about the five steps for transformation. So some of the concepts in here, things you might have heard of before, but what we're really trying to do is just emphasize the use of those across these transformation projects throughout the organization. So how does transformation affect you? Well, before we get into some of the architectural content in here, it's worth emphasizing some of the more recent, let's say, scenarios that we've faced and this really is a chance for us to talk about the benefits and I guess the consequences of technology transformation. Um, and specifically technology in this case. So from a, a fintech background, there are aspects in here which would incorporate things like startup banks. And, and some of you might have heard of these, certainly here in the UK. And we have things like Monzo and we have things like Starling Bank. So some of the ex-CEOs from there come from actual, um, let's say, physical bank structures. And then N26, I think, is a bit more popular across Europe. And um, but these are fintech companies that have come into this world to almost disrupt those kind of banking models that traditionally existed. 
what's enabled that is the technology. You know, being able to submit for things like loans online. We have constant notifications where we're spending our money. There are no ATMs or branches in place. It's all done through mobile or online. They've also decided, because that's where they've stemmed from, to move into other areas. So you'll find some of these, let's say, fintechs move into things like um, investing and cryptocurrency and various other aspects where maybe banks would see high risk. These startup-like cultures can start leveraging some of those newer technologies quicker. So what that tends to do, of course, is challenge the industry. And of course, that's no bad thing. And it does mean that there's more innovation, perhaps, across these sectors. But it's useful to know that, of course, this becomes much more beneficial. So especially these days, especially during the pandemic, these types of companies have actually been quite fundamental for allowing users to manage their money easier. The benefits, um, I guess, tend to, to blind us sometimes to the consequences. Now, consequences can be spread across various industries up here. Um, and we'll quickly go through some of these. And one of the first ones is here and here, I think it's like dating apps. So when dating apps first came out, um, of course, there was levels of criticism around that. Um, but a lot of people felt that they could actually connect with like-minded people. And the consequences, of course, are then on those pubs and the bars and the clubs and the restaurants that used to host these type of events and now have to maybe close down because of that technology transformation that's happening. More recently, technology has actually enabled us to start having part payments for content online. There are various retail industries out there that will allow you to pay for things every three months, every six months, which is great for those people who maybe don't have the finances at the time. But again, the consequences of that type of technology transformation means people become indebted. Across online news, that's, of course, a key one, and um, whether it's things like newspapers, whether it's the way we actually consume the information, um, that's, of course, been a big impact from a technology perspective. But so has things like you know, camera quality. You know, everyone's got a mobile phone these days. Um, I'd hazard a guess that probably not many people have been installing or been buying you know, GPS trackers. And have you ever called a travel agent recently or called to book a taxi? You know, all of these things are actually done through our phone now. So that technology transformation, again, can have consequences on those other industries. So it is something to keep in mind. Now, there are bigger shifts which we need to think about, which is the technology itself can drive changes which might not actually be immediately obvious. So if you think of something like the car industry, it's probably been one of the sector's biggest technology transformations applied. Now, when we think of the car industry, the main technology transformation that we tend to think about are things like maybe the introduction of automatic cars years ago, and then, of course, more recently, things like self-driving cars. However, what's actually happening here is it isn't necessarily that technology of self-driving cars that's the issue. But cars have actually just become software platforms. And some of the biggest technology transformations across semiconductors, neural networks, cameras, all of those types of cutting edge technology transformations are happening within the car industry. So it's not camera manufacturers, it's not semiconductor manufacturers, it's these car manufacturers that are actually on the cutting edge of those types of technologies. So these are important aspects, and it's not, of course, just the automotive industry that's effective. Every industry is likely affected by these changes. So whether it's healthcare, whether it's agriculture, the pattern exists across all of these areas. And each of these industries then have to, of course, try and harness that technology. And it has to be really the kind of driving force behind that is how we actually understand the information, the data behind each of these areas. Each individual area will have their own challenges as well. Um, I mean, we were talking about things earlier on around things like um, insurance companies and the way they're leveraging things like technology transformation. Um, traditionally, there might have been models, predictive models, um, and now they're live models. You know, people, these kind of insurance companies are assessing how we're driving, accurately real-time data in terms of all of that content that's going on, 
gets passed back directly to those industries. And then they can offer things like you know, pay as you go coverage. Um, again, the benefit, but the consequence is you bypass some of those agents in between. So each industry is affected. Digital transformation, technology transformation, really the way to think about that is it was really an eventuality. And more so these days, it's actually become a necessity. Another interesting aspect of this is the, the maybe the age old question, I guess, of strategy versus execution. So there are various reports and studies um, that you can find that will likely balance out between strategy is best and execution is best. In reality, it's both. Um, and I think that's hopefully relatively obvious, but we always have the best strategy, but no means of executing it. And we could have a really bad strategy and executing that, of course, isn't ideal either. The biggest thing to take away from this, however, is the significant difference in those companies who actually have something like a technology or a digital transformation strategy, which is about 70% from some surveys. However, only 10% of those actually have some ways of executing that. There's a big shift here as well between um, levels within an organization. So senior executives might typically think or feel relatively comfortable their organizations are prepared. But a more recent study has shown that actually a third of those IT personnel within the same company would actually be concerned if their senior executive knew maybe how unprepared they actually were. So part of what we talk about later on in terms of the five steps is making sure that there's an understanding across the whole organization here and that we aren't just building strategies without actually understanding where we are today. So it's a really important aspect. Both, of course, are needed. Um, and really, in recent times, we have to make sure that we can actually adapt to each of these situations as well. So we have to be realistic about what we think is almost like this utopia state, but we also have to be realistic in terms of what resources we have to execute those types of plans. From those studies, there are probably three main points that we can actually look at in terms of why maybe most companies or some companies aren't actually ready for, for these maybe large scale transformation projects. So one of the first is a lack of commitment. We then have lack of resources and then lack of technology. And these are noted, by the way, these aren't things that maybe have been discovered through some kind of analysis. These are actual admitting concepts from those people that have been interviewed from different companies and they realize that these are the issues but there's always a flip side to that you know how do we actually then start making ourselves more committed to these environments well part of that is understanding what we want to do where we want to go understanding this vision the resource aspects comes into making things more efficient we might be applying our energy in the wrong direction to the wrong areas so making sure that we have enough resources that are directed correctly becomes important. And more importantly for this particular call, um, WebEx today would be the lack of technology and using the right tech at the right time. So there are a couple of examples that we go through for using the right tech at the right time. And this is just to give you some context where companies have um, gone head first into technology, let's say, instead of treating digital transformation as solving the problem first and then applying the technology that exists. So these companies in here have, have varying degrees of, I'm not sure if I'll call them successes, but certainly varying degrees of how they've applied transformation. Um, some of you might have heard of a company called Juicero. Um, so probably about four years ago, I think they probably closed down. Um, but essentially what they had was, I guess in their mind, cutting edge technology. They had this ability to apply um, four tons of pressure to extract juice from these packets that were sold here as subscription models. And they'd sell this $400 machine to carry that out. So these were the kind of special fruit bags that were being used. And that's what was needed for this machine. It could connect to the Wi-Fi. It could check the expiration dates of these juices. Um, however, this is 
the impact of using technology first instead of solving the actual problem. So at the time, those juice packs that was on subscription models and got sent to every household that had ordered them, you could easily squeeze those out of that pack with your hands. So that 400 machine that had had all that technology invested into it became redundant. So this was effectively a total flop, let's say, as an organization who had this kind of concept. Um, but it's again, a great case study to think back on where technology is applied first, rather than finding a solution to a problem and then applying the right technology. A couple of others in here, um, partly technology transformation aspects, but also partly business models. Um, things like NASA's space pen, um, the, the classic comments at the time where they were developing a space pen because of course, ink required gravity to work in space. And um, they developed and spent probably close to a million dollars with partners developing this type of pen that could write in space. Um, and I think the comment at the times by the Russians were we just use pencils. And so again, applying technology in this space probably wasn't solving the right problem. Um, even more these days, everything is subscription based. Um, Washboard was an interesting company, um, which I've heard about, which effectively allowed people to subscribe to a service for laundry. Um, except in this case, the issue was people who went to laundrettes um, had to have quarters to be used in the machines and there was very rarely change machines available. No one really had the right change. So they provided a subscription model where you could be sent um, $20 in quarters a month for a subscription cost of $27. Um, needless to say, that didn't survive. It lasted six days. Um, I think they actually made a profit. But again, it's applying the wrong solution. So we have to think about solving the solution first and then seeing what technology exists for us to actually apply that correctly. So then we think about, well, what are the steps for transformation? And maybe more specifically, what are the five steps that we should be going through for executing these type of technology or digital transformation strategies? So the first is to define a vision. Um, it's something we've already mentioned. The second is auditing the current situation. So of course you need to have a good grounding of where you are. We'll take a quick look at determining digital maturity, how we actually measure and adjust our way through modeling that current situation. And arguably the most important aspect here is this communication aspect. So we'll touch on each of these topics um, and it's very likely some of you will have questions on each of these as well, so feel free to type those into the chat window. But certainly when we look at the first one for defining a vision, this becomes the first stage. And, and again, we'll, we'll relay this back to Togaf towards the end, but defining the vision is probably one of the, the fundamental aspects. Now, that vision in terms of a digital transformation or a technology transformation, um, could be understanding who's involved in this process. What are we actually trying to achieve? Are we trying to increase customer satisfaction, trying to reduce costs, make our processes more efficient? If we're looking at technology transformation projects, are we trying to keep up with the market? So those fintechs who come in and disrupt things, do we now need to pivot and address where we're maybe lacking those specific technologies? Having that vision in place, is one of the fundamental aspects of that. And previously we've talked about this um, and you really do have to get other areas of the organization involved. Once everyone's on board, once everyone has a clear idea of what that vision is, it makes it much easier to move forward and actually start trying to build some kind of successful output. Another key aspect of defining that vision is to actually model those situations, model the environment. You know, when you have a lot of data that's spread across the organization, this is key, of course, for understanding that vision, which would be, if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you can go. And so defining that means capturing the information, identifying maybe the key capabilities or processes in the organization. If we're going to go through some kind of technology transformation, what systems are in place? What do they support? Are there regulations we need to abide by? These are all the aspects that then lead into the ability of managing that current situation. 
So again, that data that we might have needs to be centralized. So whether it's you know, Excel spreadsheets that you have, visual documents you want to use, connecting to other service providers, building a current situation, a current model, becomes, of course, the key aspect of then building on top of that. The current situation itself, I think, varies as well. I mean, if you're, as an organization, looking at introducing a technology transformation project or a digital transformation project, um, Understanding that current situation means that you can make more rational decisions. And what that really means is that you can actually start focusing on the areas that are of concern. And I think focus is one of the key aspects to pick up from today as well. Digital transformation projects range in size, and I think the majority of time is an indication that they are large, hence the transformational projects. So it's important make sure that there's always a focus on that initial vision and a focus of what the output should be. One of the ways of doing that is to actually start planning the types of metrics or KPIs you want to count. So when we talk about fintechs, for example, um, when they were introducing things like the loan schemes and the ability to interact with customers and the ability to have notifications through on their phone, there were certain KPIs those fintechs were trying to achieve um, and certainly that's where the focus was. So you're focusing maybe on customer growth, maybe you're focusing on reducing costs, and maybe you're just focusing on new markets, but making sure that you have an understanding of where you are, what that vision is, and providing that information is, again, another fundamental step for managing things like transformations. There's an interesting aspect in here, which we call digital maturity. And when I say we've called it this, there's various digital maturity models that you can actually leverage. Um, and there are various aspects that become quite important. Once you have your current situation modeled, you do need to have maybe a degree of self-awareness. And I think that was maybe evident in some of the, the downfalls of companies like Juicero, for example. Um, you need to have a clear understanding of these type of topics within internal organizations and who the customer is and what kind of preferred channels do we have any partners that we're working with. There's an organization or a people aspect to the maturity as well. When there's a, a significant degree of technology change, we have to make sure that we can actually match that digital maturity curve. People internally might be susceptible to change others might not want to go through those changes of technology so it's about making sure that we can actually support each part of those processes across the organization capabilities really come down to things like the operating model um, again we want to enhance the effectiveness of the organization and how are we actually utilizing technology to drive those different processes um, throughout um, the model and of course strategy is those digital initiatives so this is embedded within the overall business strategy, but it's the effect of actually transforming the organization. If we had to pick on one of these, of course, for today, it'd be technology. So when we think about technology, the digital maturity that we're trying to rate here are things like our IT support team. How many channels are we actually working within? Are there security aspects we need to consider if we are developing new technology? And when it comes to the systems and the applications we have, if we're removing systems, we're adding new systems, all of this needs to be taken into consideration to effectively calculate this digital maturity score. Now, the main reason for doing that is to actually understand, again, where you are, but how flexible and how easy it is to going to be to change. It also helps drive some of the focus points. So every industry or every organization that goes through this process will likely have different levers that they pull across these areas. You might be working more closely with partners. You might be building more technical capabilities internally and bringing things from external companies internal. So each one of these will, will level up and down, again, depending on the focus. Once we have all of that information, um, there's always an aspect of maintaining it. Um, and that comes down to, of course, populating the information 
um, embedding something like enterprise architecture across the organization as well. So typically what we find um, as vendors, of course, and all the customers we work with, it's important when we are working on these large transformational projects that there's awareness across the organization, but also that ability for users to contribute content as well. And what tends to happen as users contribute information, it gives us the ability to actually measure and adjust those outcomes. So data owners need quick access to the systems that they have. Now, who owns the application? Who else uses it? Which applications are maybe at high risk of a cybersecurity attack? These things will affect that technology transformation project. So again, understanding where the risks are, where the opportunities are, making sure that we can actually adjust those scales, again, incredibly important. An interesting aspect of that, however, is the data that we have is usually sufficient enough to glean some insights. And what I really mean is there's never always a need to, to maintain something manually. You know, all of the information that's out there, the analytics that we can run across our systems, whether it's you know how the market's shifting, how our systems are operating, is there too much complexity in our organization? Can we rely on these vendors and these suppliers? All of that can be passed through various algorithms. So you should be taking um, arguably a, a smarter approach to using the data that you have to build these types of information or insight models. So whether it is, in this case, calculating things like the business fit and technical fit scores, whether it's calculating the digital maturity of various teams or various organizations, that might also feed in to these aspects as well. Um, and algorithms themselves, um, again, not to, to put people off here, I mean, algorithms shouldn't be necessarily complex. Um, there are various ways that we can apply algorithms. And um, we can take a, a relatively deterministic approach and, and have formula-based ways of calculating information. Um, that becomes key, of course, for calculating things like maybe the return on investment of different projects, um, the cost increase or decrease of different systems, maybe a more deterministic approach. We can take a, a more slightly non-deterministic approach here as well. You know, we might want to leverage things like machine learning. We've got all this information, we've got all this data. How can we actually just analyze that behind the scenes and start getting suggestions given to us? So if you're going through something like a technology transformation project, and you're deciding on which technology is best suited, you might have suggestions from machine learning algorithms. You know, is this technology going to give you a quicker time to market? Is this one going to make us more reliable? Does this one increase customer satisfaction? Does this make us less susceptible to, to vendors or suppliers going out of business? So there's various aspects like that to take um, on board when you are designing these type of algorithms, but they all feed into these aspects of this transformation project. A key area um, I think is worth emphasizing is this idea of what we've, well, certainly what I've referenced as these kind of transformation projects. And that's because digital transformation, technology transformation, they're scenarios. They're scenarios that we're planning. And so that again is a really important aspect of what we do as an organization and what we provide as a solution. So if you are thinking of things like transformation projects, typically don't have one. You have various baseline states, sorry, various um, target states based off a baseline. So this baseline is the current state that we've modeled and these target scenarios are the things that we might want to achieve. So the various phases of projects perhaps or completely distinct alternatives. The idea is that then how do we transition between these? So are we going to reduce the number of systems in one architecture? Are we going to increase the number in another? And really what we're doing here is building these what if scenarios to understand the impact. When you've got your vision defined and your current state model organized, these target scenarios help effectively verify that initial vision. Now, if our vision was to introduce new markets, introduce new capabilities in order to increase customer satisfaction, reduce complexity, and reduce costs, 
these target scenarios allowed us to effectively what we call um, come from trade-off scenarios. So these trade-off scenarios essentially then are calculated on these metrics. So yes, there's a whole architecture aspect to all of this behind the scenes, but really what we're doing is comparing them, comparing the performance of these different scenarios. So again, this is like technology-driven transformation. There's a really interesting um, use case here, a case study, let's say, and I guess there are many out there, but certainly one I, I remember. Um, and it's the fact that these scenarios will change and there will be multiple of them. So traditionally, when we think about things like technology-driven transformation, usually one of the first things that comes to mind in terms of companies, we think about Google, we think about Amazon, we think about Facebook. There is a company, of course, that has actually changed within a completely different industry. And that's a pizza making company. So Domino's, the pizza making company. Over here in the UK and Australia, but probably in the US as well, judging my knowledge. Um, but Domino's has actually gone through one of the biggest technology transformation projects and built different scenarios for each of those. Now, they've gone through different aspects of transformation. They might have started initially with business transformation aspects. How do they improve the toppings on their pizzas? How do they improve the crust? How do they improve the cheese to the recommendations that customers have given them? And then slowly over time, they've realized technology is where they should be focusing. So Domino's was actually one of the first companies to introduce pizza deliveries by drones. That was just one of the technology transformations that they went through. They went through another technology transformation where they actually used AI to screen the pizzas that would be made. And these pizzas would be graded based on this AI technology to see if it was good enough to be sold and sent out for delivery, or if it got rejected and then a new one was made. Then they introduced another transformational project. They allowed users and customers to track pizzas on their phone. So mobile apps could then be used once you've placed your order to track your pizza. And placing your order wasn't actually going into store anymore. You could place your order from Slack, Facebook Messenger. You could actually tweet an emoji and get your pizza delivered to you instantly. So from a pizza company, and again, what happens is they become an e-commerce company that happens to sell pizza. It's the same concept of when, of course, Amazon was just selling books. And effectively, what you're finding here is that these are multiple transformation projects and it's never ending. So they're never really finished with these transformations. They're consistently trying to innovate through these areas and they're consistently trying to make sure that they can hopefully drive these situations rather than being driven by change applied upon them. So again, it's an interesting use case and certainly an aspect where all of these aspects of their vision, building what they actually understand is the marketplace today and what they're capable of doing. Their digital maturity was realized to be really low, so they decided that's where the focus should be on the technology. And then they performed this analysis through different scenarios to understand that trade-off. Yes, delivering pizzas by drone probably wasn't cost effective, but there's a high level of risk involved and it probably made sure that they could have different avenues open to them. And yes, tracking pizzas on their phone was probably low cost, but it made them so much more efficient. It made them so much more reliable and their customer satisfaction, of course, increases as well. So again, regardless of what industry you're in, these scenarios are gonna be really useful for analyzing that. Now, the final stage of those five steps is communication. And I think this has to be one of the, the most important. I think even if we have a, a good vision, we understand what we want to do and what we want to achieve. We understand what we look like today. We've performed all of these different scenarios and realized which is best suited for going forward over the next three, six, 12 months time. It's all unnecessary unless people understand internally within the organization what's happening. So there are four aspects to this. So the first is awareness. You have to understand who the customer is, whether it's internal or external, and you have to actually understand what role they play in the organization. Once you can do that, then you can actually start managing those conversations. 
The second is context. So having a, a degree of depth and coverage across those conversations is important. You don't want to lose your audience in a room when you're conveying the strategy that you have. Whether it's so high level that you have um, internal customers in the room thinking this isn't going to work, there has to be clear transparency over the communication aspects there. But you also don't want to go into too much depth where it becomes so technical that no one understands what's going on. So there has to be context in how you actually deliver and communicate those types of transformation projects. The second is a story. And so what you're saying has to, of course, be compelling. So when you're designing these technology transformations, you have to make sure that you can actually tie these back maybe to your own experiences. What type of accomplishments are we actually expected to achieve at the end of this? You have to try and ground your audience in that journey of understanding where you are and where you want to be. Um, and finally, empathy. Um, understanding your audience is key, but you also have to understand that they have skin in the game and so do you. You have to make sure that what you're saying is credible as well. I mean, when you're producing partnerships, both internally and externally, if you don't have a degree of empathy across the challenges that people are facing, whether it's the IT team, the marketing team, DevOps team, whether it's the challenges your customers, your vendors, your suppliers are facing, it's going to be really difficult to convince them that this is the right strategy if there's no understanding of their situation. So again, communicating is, is obviously part of all of this. Um, architecture shouldn't be just a backroom thing. It should be made accessible to everyone. In terms of content on how we make that accessible, uh, we make sure that we can provide all that information um, live, real time, at the fingertips of anyone who actually wants to see it. And when we say that, what we mean is we actually try to tailor those views according to the stakeholder. So whether people want to understand things like Gantt charts and lifecycle dates, when are our applications going end of life? When are these projects coming into effect? Maybe from a process perspective, we want to start drawing out each individual process or capabilities that we have and understanding if we introduce new technology, realize that these processes are going to be affected. Realize that there's going to be some metrics change, whether it's a cost increase or decrease. The capabilities that we model, of course, um, are going to be useful for connecting the wider organization as well. So the dashboards really should be small data. Right? They should be small pieces of data. It by no means is going to be perfect. Um, and that's the main reason for information. Making sure that this is available to everyone who should be seeing it, make sure that you can actually adjust and measure things more effectively as well. And finally, we might have a really technical audience. So don't forget about those guys either. This has to be an aspect of tailoring these views according to that user base, whether it's specific knowledge about the systems we have, whether we are focusing on technology transformations using new systems, we need to be aware of those and we need to understand how that affects other areas of the organization. The key takeaway from this aspect though is to really try and avoid this kind of analysis paralysis. We want to make sure that it's consumable. Yes, there's enough technical depth there if necessary, but we're providing these high level views, gaining some feedback from those users and adjusting when necessary. And so that communication aspect, how we actually deliver this message becomes really important going forward. The next question really is, how does that tie to TOGAF? So TOGAF itself, of course, as a framework, as a methodology, has various aspects that we can leverage. Um, and there are different aspects of this, and we're certainly not going to go through each of these phases, but what you should realize is that TOGAF is there to be provided as a framework that is searchable. And we, we've said this a, a number of times where it's a toolbox. And if you think of it as a toolbox of almost different services that you can pick up on, it becomes quite obvious quite quickly how you can actually leverage aspects of that model. If you take something like you know, phase A in here, um, defining the vision, all of those aspects of defining a vision become part of that technology transformation project that we've mentioned. Establishing the project and the vision, what we actually want to do, 
you know, why we want to do that, what type of goals and drivers are there, understanding what business capabilities we have and what's going to be changing, identifying the stakeholders, you know, who are we speaking to, who are we trying to address, and then assessing the readiness, what's our digital maturity in this space. And all of those aspects from the ADM can then feed into other aspects of our project. So again, you maybe you shouldn't be using this as a sense of we need to be following each of these phases. We should be picking the ones that are useful. Um, uh, let's take another quick example. So we've got phase D in here around technology transformation. And there are various principles and practices around that. Um, and again, picking just on technology transformation becomes actually quite an important one, especially when we talk about technology transformation. One of the key principles in there actually comes back to the message earlier on in these slides, which is using the right tech at the right time. And one of those principles states, only in response to business needs are changes to technology made. And that has to be the driving force across any of these transformation projects. New technologies come and go. We shouldn't be changing on the whim of a new tech. We should be making sure that we know what the problem is, addressing it with a relevant solution and applying the right technology. So all of that comes together through that TOGAF model and all of that comes together across all of those five steps that we've mentioned as well.